Joseph, welcome to the Z Learning Podcast. Thank you so much for coming on today. Hey, Zev, it's a pleasure uh, to be here. Thank you so much. And just thinking, if it's the Z Learning Podcast, I assume you've already covered everything from A through Z and are, are just, you know, wrapping up the tail ends and some of the loose things under Z. Well, I think we might have missed one letter there, and that's G for get some class. So that's what we'll be talking about today. G is for Gristel. Uh, so you certainly missed um, uh, out some important stuff under G because I certainly wasn't covered if you've gone already from A through Z. So that's point number one. Point number two, if you're a programmer at all, you know there's kind of classes and objects within classes. So the class is Gristel and get some class as an instance, right? An object under the class Gristel. So we're gonna have lots of fun Gristel projects. And my last name is Gristel, just in case uh, anyone's wondering. Uh, and it's naturally nice that class is an object under the class Gristel. Uh, sorry, get some class as an object under the class Gristel. That works, comes together very nicely, I think. Well, kids, the letter of the day is G. So <laughs> let's get right into it. Um, so Joseph, you know, team builder events are very popular. They're fairly common in the corporate world. And of course, many companies have popped up since the pandemic to provide these kinds of experiences remotely. But your company gets some class, seems very unique with events that really seem to stretch your mind and make you laugh. What are some of the aspects of get some class that you believe set it apart from all the other corporate focused team building experiences. Yeah, so uh, just to step back and make sure the audience is up, up to speed, the big challenge in the pandemic world, and it's not the pandemic world anymore, it's the new world where people are now working remotely or hybrid or otherwise distributed around the world, kind of on a, in a permanent manner at this point, at least for many, many companies, especially in the technology industry. The challenge is you're never next to your office mate uh, you never bump into them in the hall. You're never awkwardly using the bathroom next to them. You're never getting lunch together and you're never randomly popping in to ask a question into their office. What that means is that the natural familiarity that comes from continuous exposure to people and bumping into them and saying hello and the friendship that naturally develops from that uh, is not happening. And that friendship and sense of connection is really integral to successful human organizations or human communities in general. Uh, and, and having a really awesome company means you really want people to identify strongly with the company and with their coworkers. So that's kind of the baseline challenge. And so the question becomes, how do you go about thinking uh, about connection, community, friendship, identification with the core, the, the, company, the organization, its mission, uh, so that people feel like they belong and feel connected to their coworkers. There's less friction, less social friction. They could be more candid, more honest about feedback, um, more honest about concerns, and so on in a distributed remote world where they're virtually never ne next to each other. And uh, really, it's a complex design problem. And I think there's a reasonable argument to say it's actually that there's something to be said for working next to people uh, and replacing that in a remote world is challenging. But that said, we are in a remote hybrid world and you need to be intentional about it in many, many ways. Um, there are many ways to be intentional about it, uh, you know, including creating rituals or other ways where people's personhood comes out and not just kind of in a, not just having flat work meetings. Uh, and you need to hit those in many, many ways. What we do is we provide fun uh, social events, fun team building programs, fun classes of other sorts, fun wellness uh, or EQ oriented programming to remote and hybrid teams and to live teams as well. Um, uh, so that we hit the problem from a particular angle. Uh, and that angle is there is no happy hours. There are no fun social events. There's no fun, natural fun going to a bar occurring. So you need to create that uh, when we are, we create that. Um, so uh, you asked me how we differ from other companies um, uh, that do similar things. So, you know, the classic thing, just to give people context might be a wine tasting on Zoom, right? And that's a very good thing to respond to, to react to uh, because a wine tasting on Zoom is really something that's a live activity that should be done live or works well live, you know, cause alcohol kind of greases 
social interaction, but it's the social interaction, the in-person nature of it really that drives it. And when you move something like that and just migrate it onto Zoom or some other uh, virtual platform, you're really uh, you're not really designing for the virtual environment. You're actually just taking something and moving it there. So we're all sipping our wine on Zoom. It's awkward. Uh, you know, I participated in things like that. It's better than nothing, perhaps, you know, especially when you're getting the wine or whiskey or whatever in, in, the, uh, in the mail. But it's not really, it's not, it's not organic. It doesn't feel natural and so on. So uh, one of the ways that uh, we differ is we design very carefully for Zoom uh, or for a virtual space. So let's say we were doing a wine tasting, for example. We wouldn't have the wine exclusively drive the experience. We'd bring on, we'd have an improv host or some, someone else that's kind of turning it into a game or otherwise creating a program that drives a certain element of interactivity that's not just relying on the default of people getting on and you know chatting because that doesn't happen naturally in Zoom. Um, uh, and then, but most of the time we're trying to do things that are a bit innovative and funky and different, you know? So we got started, for example, our first program was a chess program with a uh, US chess champion. So uh, we focus on awesome talent that's really unique. So it's kind of, you're really getting a cool experience with somebody who's really neck, uh, uh, a master of their field. Uh, you know, the chess people we use, we use the reigning US women's chess champion. You know, we use one of the best uh, chess players in the world, male chess players in the world. Um, and we have a program there that's a chess strategy talk, chess tournament, or a chess and business strategy, right? Uh, we have a salsa dance party concept for the world salsa champion. We have a freestyle rap show, which is this interactive freestyle rap program uh, with this unbelievable freestyle rapper. Um, and, uh, you know, it's customized and created on the spot based on the company and the people there. This guy was just pulled off by Cirque du Soleil to run a show in Vegas, for example, uh, which means that he's going to become even more exorbitant, but he's unbelievable. He's awesome. And it's so entertaining. People are blown away every time. Uh, and often what we'll do is we'll take existing concepts and we'll put them together in a novel, cool way. So this freestyle rap show, unbelievable on its own. We have a stakeout dinner concept, you know, where we'll send everyone a 24 ounce steak and potatoes and herbs and pepper and salt, you know, uh, have an awesome cooking event with a chef, right? Also awesome on its own. Then we married them. So we have a concept called wine, dine and rhyme. And we'll send everyone the steak package or some other food, you know, depends on what we're doing. Uh, we'll send everyone wine if they, uh, you know, if there's budget for it, if people want it. And then we'll have the freestyle rapper come on at the end and do this interactive program. So that you have something that is greater than the sum of its parts and is really unique, compelling and, um, and unbelievable. And the responses to that particular program has just been kind of like blow away. Um, uh, I think I told you before, and you can pause me if you want to kind of move on or I'm going too long. Uh, I think I told you before that the virtual background I have, it's actually a copy of a physical background I have. And the way I got that physical background uh, is one door, I, uh, sorry, one day I opened my front door and there's this tall UPS package standing out there. And I'm like, what the hell is this? I didn't order anything like this. You know, uh, looks like some stick uh, um, or some other kind of uh, something that would hold something really elongated. And what is this? So I opened it up. Turns out someone had sent me a physical background, just akin to the virtual one that's behind me that hangs yeah, just, on. Just explain to the listeners. So most people will be listening to this. There's a green background behind Joseph with uh, the logo of get some class. Okay, so go on. Yeah, and it's custom design and it says on air on it and it's nice. Uh, and that's, and I have that in physical with a stand. I thought some brilliant salesperson had come up with this unbelievable sales tactic and was fool enough to chase this young guy building a young business with no cash flow um, or <laughs> limited cash flow, but sent it to me. And I was like, wow, brilliant salesman out there. This is unbelievable. I couldn't have thought of a better gift, you know, had I, you know, just had I. Uh, that guy was me. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, Zev, you know, uh, you should, if you're doing that, you should go after really big enterprise sales. <laughs> um, but uh, it turns out it was a company that we had done that Dine and Rhyme program for. And the person who ran the company, a small company, uh, um, so enjoyed the program and everyone who attended it so enjoyed it that they went out of their way to have their marketing team design this, send it to somebody to manufacture and then shipped it to me and I was blown away. So anyway, that's just a sense of like the impression that a program like that makes at times. So uh, I hope that answers your question. The, uh, to summarize, I would say, you know, thoughtfulness in designing carefully for the, particular, for the environment and for the company in particular, as much as we can. 
uh, you know, the quality of the talent. Uh, so really people that are unique and really deliver well. And then, you know, the innovativeness and, and dif differentiation of the nature of our programs, what we're doing programs in, uh, as opposed to kind of just, you know, replicating wine tasting or some other thing like that. Awesome. So walk us through, uh, you know, looking at your events on your website, linked in the show notes, you seem to offer a lot of things that are quite out of the box. Uh, might, one might call some of your events highly intellectual, like brain teasers or, or, or elitist maybe, or even quirky at times, you know, everything from wine Let's go and with dine. funky rather than elitist. Uh, funky. Yeah. Don't limit my market, you know. Uh. <laughs> I would say, yeah, elite meaning like it's, it's something very uh, classy. Classy. That's a great word. Exactly. Classy, funky. You know, just to give some people a feel like you already described uh, chess tournaments, wine and dine, um, freestyle rapping while doing yoga. I mean, some of them are really funny, too. Is there a common theme behind all of these events? They, they fall into different tracks. You know, there's some um, uh, I, there's not necessarily a common theme. The common theme is trying to find things that are really engaging and thoughtful. So some of them are, you know, strong, more, stronger on the engaging. Some of them are stronger on the thoughtful. Some of them are a combination. Um, you know, like we have a name that tune program with a live DJ with this unbelievable setup. So, you know, super engaging, fun program. Um, uh, then we have, uh, you know, the uh, the haha -ha yoga program, which is a combination of comedy and yoga, just because I felt that yoga tends to be borderline comedic at times. Uh, and so lightening up and laughing while you're doing it, I thought would be, uh, you know, a thoughtful, fun way uh, of doing it. Um, uh, the, I would say the common denominator is kind of uh, the emphasis on fun and thoughtfulness, uh, the emphasis on quality, um, and, uh, you know, the, the people delivering it. That is the main common denominator. And then there are the buckets that they fit, fit into. So there's programs that I would call, uh, the way I categorize it is there are social events. Social events are kind of akin to a happy hour. They're meant to have fun and just, you know, connect with teammates in a fun Loosen setting. up, loosen your tie. Exactly. There are things that I call team building. Team building is more of, you know, an interactive activity. Uh, so that might be, uh, you know, uh, uh, an espionage game, for example, where we have actors play fake employees in your company, and then people have to figure out who's real and who's fake. Uh, it might be a paratrooper training simulation workshop where a commander, a former commander of U.S. Army Ranger training goes ahead and runs people through a series of different exercises and groups. Um, that's kind of, uh, you know, the team building concept. Uh, then there is, you know, wellness uh, thoughtful wellness oriented programs like, uh, you know, our how to do nothing workshop, which is kind of the mindfulness 101 with uh, a retreat leader, uh, director of the mindful awareness research center at UCLA and uh, haha -ha yoga is another example of the thoughtful wellness. Uh, we have a self compassion program. Can you just explain what the haha -ha yoga one is a little bit because that sounds really so someone's doing stand up while people are doing yoga positions or? yeah basically it's uh it's it's a play on hatha yoga if you're familiar with yoga that's yes. a form of yoga and it, we're it's basically it's a yoga program and then there's just some light joking in the background like commentary by you know uh, a comedian um, that's awesome. uh just to be you know just to give some gentle laughter to it as well um uh, and then we have a track i call contemporary and cultural and this is might be where you're getting at the i don't know what i would call it brainy i would call it um you know, there's a, a certain intellectual dimension to some of the programming. Um, so for example, there's you know, one common concept out there is a paint night, right? So uh, we have a paint night, um, uh, an art night, uh, whatever you want to call it. But like I said, we try to stamp it with a certain uniqueness. So the way we do that, like I said, is talent. The person who leads our, 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 our you know, art night program called Coral Creations is a world-class artist. You know, she just opened the show in a fancy gallery in Manhattan. She was in another one up the Hudson in another a fancy gallery that's never had a live artist actually uh, uh, show for a live artist before her. Um, and then her work is focused on uh, fragile ecosystems. So she goes traveling all over the world. Uh, right now she's focused on the ocean and coral reefs. Uh, she goes, she scuba dives and observes the reefs in person, takes photographs 
brings them home and then paints these unbelievable oceanic landscapes, coral reef landscapes. Uh, uh, they're really, they're, they're just, you know, mind blowing. Uh, and, um, and then we do a coral reef themed painting. We send everybody an art supplies kit with everything they need. Like I said, we try to be thoughtful. So in addition to everything they need, including like a step-by-step -step instruction sheet with which paintbrush we're using and a thumbnail image of what we're doing in that step, uh, an extra canvas if someone wants to paint along with them, we also put in our theme uh, snack package. So we have a pallet-shaped cookie with the, we'll put the company uh, name on it that we're doing the program for, chocolate paintbrush, color coordinated candies, a welcome card with a, you know some uh, welcoming them to the event, describe a picture of the a piece of the artist's artwork on the back. Uh, and then we will uh, add often a marine biologist to talk to the coral reef element uh, and the science, the oceanic science while we're painting. Uh, so to add, add a, you know, there's the artistic layer, there's the tactile, you know, the painting layer, there is the uh, scientific. The, yeah, the scientific layer and a tasting layer, uh, you know, some food, some you know, complementary as in uh, uh, not as in free as in compliment, well, complimenting the event well, uh, uh, snacks, um, and then, you know, the marine biologist adding the scientific layer. So that's a good example of the way in which we kind of try to des design for, thoughtfully from a multi-sensory perspective. Um, so that's, and, and that was all an example of like contemporary and cultural, um, if that makes that's sense. That's right. So it seems like you engage a lot of uh, different aspects of the senses, the brain, the heart, laughter, um, you know, the scientific aspect, the, you know, um, getting people moving or painting or uh, doing something kind of physical. Um, I can see how that would be very engaging and sort of um, get people to utilize different areas of their talent. And I'm sure that that probably brings to the fore some people's unique um, maybe talents or unique aspects of their personalities. Um, maybe helps them bond in a different way than they would while doing their regular work day. And now a lot of this, most of the time is on Zoom. Yeah, uh, by the fall, we use Zoom. Uh, we'll use other platforms. Uh, we've used Remo uh, in the past. Uh, sometimes I'll do things on a workplace metaverse platform called SoWork, where people can actually walk around with an avatar and walk up to other people. And then their videos join uh, if it's a techie crowd or people. So you're using want. immersive technology as well. Yeah, it, 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 when it's for the right audience, usually there's a learning curve there. So, um, uh, but if if for the right audience, I'll use that. Um, uh, the I want to jump back to to something you touched on, which is important, which is that aspects of people that may not come out in the workplace uh, often will come out here uh, in ways that allow you to see your colleagues and other people in a richer, more multi-dimensional way, more human way that I think is beautiful and, and, and really nice. So we did a program, uh, we have an improv program, which is very, uh, you know, what's basically, we'll do a series of interactive games uh, meant to be playful, uh, li laughing, loosening up, doing fun, you know, um, uh, having more fun and lightness uh, in the environment. Uh, so, you know, for example, an activity you might do there is, uh, is something called, this is my friend. And the way that works is basically, I say, you know, I'm Joseph and this is my friend Zev. And Zev uh, likes to row gondolas in Venice. And um, so Zev will say, Oh, I'm rowing my gondola. Oh, this, this canal is so hard to move through. Oh my gosh, there's so many. It's become such a tourist trap here. I like, you know, I earn money from, from it, but it's just, you know, sometimes I just feel like the whole beauty of the idyllic nature of this is just kind of like uh, crazy and my muscles hurt and oh, oh, you know, I've been doing this all day, but my wife- Wanna throw these tourists overboard. <laughs> uh, yeah, but you better bring home more money, whatever. And then you'll be like, oh, this is my friend Joseph. And Joseph likes to pretend that he is, uh, you know, a dancer, right? And, and so you know, kind of get this playful um, uh, vibe going on in a way that's very atypical for the workplace, but very, very beautiful. Uh, and what you see is uh, what someone mentioned to me after we did a program was, that some of the people that are generally quiet were really, you know, active and very good on the spot and 
uh, shining. And then some of the people who don't stop talking actually clammed up, you know, when they were in the spotlight in this way, in a very interesting uh, uh, way of, uh, you know, uh, in a very interesting shift. So it, it, you do get different aspects of people coming out. And that's good because, you know, oftentimes we, we flatten individuals, we flatten people we interact with into oh, this guy does this in this way or this person is like this right and uh we don't see their multi-dimensionality their their fuller personhood it's hard we're not them and we have limited interactions with them but uh the they do have a more robust you know every person has many elements to them that are kind of uh it may not we may not know about and uh, we'll often pigeonhole people based on this kind of, you know, one type of interaction we've had and expanding that, giving the opportunity for people to show themselves in different ways. is just a beautiful human thing to do and also expands our uh, imagination of what they might do or how they might contribute. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's just all, all around uh, a beautiful thing to give people the opportunity to shine in ways or or show themselves in ways that might not happen in the ordinary workflow. And that's, that's beautiful and very interesting. So like someone who could be a, a Stanley at work might be a Michael once they're on one of your classes uh, for those who watch The Office, it's an office reference. But I suppose, yeah, uh, <laughs> I'm not such a big office guy or at least I, not that I'm not, I just haven't watched very much of it, but uh, exactly. Definitely should. There's even an episode where they do a team builder, but it, it's kind of ridiculous. But, you know, you can watch that whenever. Um, so you have a law, a legal background. Um, I know that, you know, you're a lawyer and what I'm curious, what got you into creating virtual events and experiences? And are your events geared more towards law firms or are there specific types of companies for which your events are a particularly good fit? Yeah, so uh, I, uh, I, was, I practiced as a lawyer for a number of years, uh, three and a half years as a tax lawyer, um, you know, on these large billion dollar mergers and so on, or bond issuances, stock issuances, other complex financial instruments. And uh, I wrote the tax disclosures and many of these things that no one ever reads uh, and are there just to, you know, cover risk. Um, uh, I, so I went to Harvard for law school. I enjoyed law school tremendously, but when I started working as a lawyer, I kind of felt cat, you know, stuck. I didn't feel like there was much exercise for creativity, for playfulness, for jumping around, for ideating, for innovating. And I realized it was kind of not the best fit for my character, my personality, uh, and who I was. And but it was my first job, so I didn't have an, a way, you know, anything else really. And then the pandemic came along, and I just started thinking about virtual programming. I landed in virtual corporate events, spoke to the events director of my law firm, you know, had some chats with her and then proposed, you know, the idea of a chess event just randomly. Uh, and she's like, oh, that sounds interesting. Why don't you do, put it together and do a demo for us? The rest is, you know, pretty much history. I found the US chess champion, put together a package, a chess set, chess snacks, chess cookies, chess chocolates, sent it to them, did the demo. They enjoyed it. I invited other events people to another demo. They enjoyed it. Two weeks later, a top 20 law firm asked me to book the program. Uh, so I had a sale. I built out some more sales from there, built out some more programs. And then a few months later, I'm like, I'm going to figure out how to you know, do this. And I walked out the door and been building uh, our programming and the company since. So that's kind of how I landed here. Um, as far as who we service, so we work with lots of companies, um, you know, generally companies that are remote or distributed or hybrid on the remote side. Uh, and then uh, law firms as well, a lot, because I come from that world. Uh, during the pandemic, that was remote. And now that's starting to be in person. Uh, for law firms in particular, we'll do, uh, we'll do fun events. So like, for example, we just hosted um, a live chess tournament and board game night at a major law firm uh, in the city. And we'll also, we also have a new series of EQ oriented programming, um, programming that's intended to enhance the communication skills, the emotional intelligence, uh, just wiser into soft, able, what people call soft skills, but soft skills, psychological safety, um, you know, uh, um, the ability to kind of interact in more wholesome, playful ways, uh, reducing hierarchy. Law firms tend to be very hierarchical. They're, they're very, they're legacy models that have been around for a long time. And 
uh, haven't shown much evidence of you know strong uh, change. Uh, and you have many brilliant people there, and there's they're kind of are excellent at their work, but often, especially once you see other companies, tech companies, and the like. The culture is, is much more stuffy and rigid than in many of these places. And what that results in is there's a certain social anxiety that people feel, especially lower on the ladder, um, which is completely unnecessary. And the demands of the job are high enough that uh, it's just very unfortunate and it's, it's, it's a shame. So, uh, you know, our programming there is geared towards helping them become slightly more playful spaces and more socially wiser and warmer spaces. So we do work with law firms and we also work with tech companies and other, you know, uh, other, you know, any company really that's working remote. So like the company I mentioned that sent me this is a small company that does consulting, epidemiological consulting for the CDC. Uh, we've done programs for Facebook. We've done programs for Capital One. We've done programs for the Boston Consulting Group. Um, uh, we've done programs for startups, so it's a pretty broad range. Um, and it sounds uh, like you have a variety of offerings and tracks for different ones. So for a company that's a little more traditional, a little more corporate or buttoned up, a little more conservative, you might have offerings that are better fit for them. And for ones that are very techy and tech savvy, you may have, uh, things a little more quirky or brainy out of the box for them. And some that have very unconventional, uh, maybe creative cultures you know you have offerings for them it sounds like yep uh we have uh at this point we have you know 30 to 40 different programs and we'll also you know do things custom as well so uh we just added one that's you know it's a lego competition event uh with a winner of lego masters tv show so like uh that's a you know yeah how, how big are the, tech. In the instructors it sounds like you have um people who are like, you know, top artists, comedians, scientists. It's, it, I think, how, how much do you think instructor really sets the tone or how, how much difference do you think it makes to have a, um, someone who's kind of a name in the, in the respective field of whatever they're doing in the event? Yeah, um, so there are a few different ways in which that can make a difference. Um, uh, first of all, you know, people just like the feel of, interacting with somebody who's kind of, you know, quasi celebrity uh, or celebrity ish. Right. Um, but uh, from a, you know, quality perspective, the subject matter expertise, deep subject matter expertise makes for something that's much richer. You know, when you meet somebody who just knows so much about something, it often could be something very arcane, but it's just very natural to be, uh, very engaged by that. So I'll give you, you know, super random example. Your background is a series of canals in Venice. If you met somebody who was part of the canal management team, whatever the hell that is, it probably exists, I imagine, in Venice, right? And this guy's been there for 30 years, a girl, and they just know the canal so well they know the challenges where are their leaks and how do they keep the buildings from leaking and how sorry just for the people listening this is my zoom background talking yeah about. zev's virtual background is uh you know a venetian canal filled with gondolas um uh and buildings that probably spring leaks all the time uh so you know there are just so many fascinating questions that you can ask and that's a relatively interesting topic but when somebody knows so much about something the expertise in and of itself is fascinating. The kinds of questions you would never have thought of asking, the detail, the uh, amount, like let's say you met a map maker and this guy just knows so much about it, right? You never would have thought very much about the subject when this guy has so much rich detail and information. He can keep in the average audience engaged for you know, quite a period of time with the richness of the detail um, you know, and, and what he notices or she notices about the world and what she or he can tell you. So deep subject matter expertise is always or almost always going to be very interesting uh, and captivating in and of itself. So that's kind of one of the reasons why you want to get really good people. And then also the entertainment quality. Uh, you want people that who can get on and uh, keep the audience attention, especially in a Zoom platform where you need to be providing some sort of stimulation that's above a certain threat quality threshold in order to keep people engaged and feel them have them feel like they're part of something as opposed to just you know being on a zoom call so amazing so yeah that that kind of is a good segue for my next question you said getting them to feel like they're part of something 
Um, and we're all about learning here on the Z Learning Podcast. So why do you think team building events like the ones that you create are so important and necessary for a company's culture? In what way do team builders contribute to a company's retention or growth? Um, and, you know, for people who are thinking, is this something in our budget? Should we do this? You know, what kind of metrics do you look at to measure outcomes like employee satisfaction, engagement? You know, how do you measure its effectiveness? And what do you think is the benefit for a company that does team building events like this? Yeah, so uh, a lot of points there. Uh, we might start by talking about, uh, you know, employee retention. Employee retention is an expression of job satisfaction, you know, to a large degree. Um, and one of the uh, in, most important points about this is that beyond a certain threshold, compensation actually doesn't really drive retention. Uh, and actually, it's culture uh, and belonging that drive retention once the need for compensation is met. Um, and uh, you can lose people left and right, even though you compensate them well enough, uh, if you're not careful about culture. Well, sorry, just to cut in, I mean, right now, this is especially relevant, wouldn't you say, with the great resignation and so many people changing jobs? Yeah, 100%. It's especially relevant with the great resignation. And one of the drivers of the resignation, you know, there's very good data on this. Um, uh, um, there's an article from this great guy, Ben Zweig, labor economist who runs a workforce analytics startup called Revelio Labs. And uh, culture, they've shown that culture is a, a or the major driver of attrition. Um, and companies with, that do it better retain much more and are not suffering from the great resignation. And an element of that are, are social events. Now, I don't know if social events are more of a, you know, a symptom of a great culture or a driver of a great culture or a mixture of both. But when people take the time to have fun together, to bond, to connect, that shows a certain uh, emphasis from the company on, uh, on that measure, on, on the importance of that and the importance of culture and the importance of the connectivity. And it drives uh, connectivity as well. So uh, when you're having fun together, when you're laughing, you get to feel the human side of your colleagues. You get to feel that your boss is, you know, not just a scary person that, you know, oversees all your work and criticizes you, but also is, a, uh, is, is human and fun and playful and light. And, you know, when you get to make your boss be the dancer, you know, in, our, in the improv activity, for example, mm -hmm. uh, it, it just it makes it less hierarchical and makes it more human, the environment. Hopefully uh, they don't dance like Elaine, though. Sorry, another... Seinfeld reference there, but yeah, uh, as long as they're trying, you know, well, we, we're not going to laugh at, we'll laugh with, right? right? <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, that's the, the next day you might not hesitate as much to ask them a, a question that you're afraid might be stupid, right? And that's reduces transaction costs and increases the sense of belonging and connectivity, as I said before. And ultimately, you know, the all these kind of measures, the goal is, I mean, the reason to do them, if you're, should be because there are good things to do. They're, you know, having fun, connecting, and having a good culture is a good thing to do. But ultimately, they also affect the bottom line in the sense that uh, the happier people are, the more connected they are, the more uh, friendly with their colleagues they are, the more they feel like they belong here. And this is their, you know, the company is part of their identity. And so they stay longer. And retention, you know, is obviously a critical component of a successful business uh, and has a profound impact on the bottom line. Uh, now, obviously, you run a, one social event and you expect your retention numbers to, to change. That's just ridiculous. Uh, you know, it has to do with your whole comprehensive approach and you know, how you do things over time. But social events and fun and team building exercises and allowing people to uh, connect with each other in manners in a manner other than just you know working over a spreadsheet or whatever other project they may work on together uh so they can experience more of the uh, you know personality and dimensions of their colleagues is something that contributes uh significantly to uh you know people's sense of connection and feeling and uh, for their colleagues and belonging so that's kind of the uh, that's, that's the reason why things like this are important and you can do them in different ways. It doesn't have to be a fancy cooking event. You know, it could be a, uh, um, you know, a fun game boggle that you guys play online or, you know, you, as long as you just, you're intentional and thoughtful about it. Um, uh, it, it is, imp it's important to use something to drive that social, uh, feel. Yeah. And I think that a lot of, 
I don't want to stereotype, but maybe more old school business owners um, might not understand is that today we're, we're increasingly connected, but also disconnected. Technology, um, not to mention during the pandemic, of course, when people weren't able to do things socially uh, in person, but also just, you know, I think people are craving a sense of community. Um, and like you said, once financial expectations are met, people have options, people, um, you know, they know what goes on at other companies, we have social media, um, and your best people aren't necessarily going to stay uh, unless you invest in helping them, you know, create an, an atmosphere, an environment, where they feel valued and appreciated, and they like coming to work, and people, it is worth um, investment in, in keeping people happy, um, not to mention because it saves a lot um, with retention, but also acquiring a new employee, the costs are a lot higher. Yeah, uh, training, uh, acquisition, you know, recruitment bonuses, the costs are enormous, right? Solving retention, increasing your retention, even by a few percentage points, the bottom line savings are tremendous. No question about that, right? Culture is an integral ingredient in that. And as a subset of culture, fun, laughter, um, you know, warm, warmth, uh, open heartedness, uh, are all a subset of culture and how you drive things like that. Um, uh, or, you know, there are many ways to drive. And one important integral part is doing things that are fun, doing things that have people laughing, doing things that have people sharing, doing things that have people chilling out, doing things that, um, you know, share rich experiences together and bring out people's connection, working on a challenge together, right? That's kind of the, um, that's kind of the, uh, that's the idea. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I think that with so much competition and people changing jobs and things, I think companies do need to step out, step up and be competitive and, and, and um, get better at kind of creating like happy, uh, cohesive cultures. Um, and I can think of another benefit, even that we didn't even address yet. But uh, another side benefit of doing your events is it makes really great content. So if you're a business and, you know, I'm speaking as a marketer now, but if you're a business and you want to get attention on social media, attract customers or attract better job candidates, um, help, you know, say, Hey, we're a great place to work, uh, and, and attract better talent, especially when, you know, a lot of people are jumping ship. Uh, it could be a very good idea to share, um, some videos, photos of your, team having a great time at one of Joe's events. So I think that's another uh, benefit. Yeah. Uh, celebrating um, and promoting uh, aspects of a good culture are a good thing to do. Uh, they have to actually reflect the reality though. That's reflect your brand. Absolutely. hundred percent. It has to be consistent. Um, but, you know, so to close out, what's next, what's next for get some class, um, where do you see your company going over the next few years? And more broadly speaking, where do you foresee the industry of virtual team builders going over the next decade or so? Yeah, uh, I have no idea uh, the, the industry or, you know, if, if it's kind of an industry even yet, but um, uh, I expect that there will be, as the world continues remotely and hybrid and, you know, distributed, people just see that doing things like this is useful and has a use, so uh, there will be continued uh, application for it. Um, our company is going to get some class is going to focus both on live and virtual uh, and hybrid. Uh, we're going to extend our portfolio. We're also going to you know, be building more of the you know, EQ uh, human warmth in the workplace type of programming, because I see that as integral and very, very valuable. Uh, and the mixture of fun and thoughtfulness as something that could be very effective there, right? So sometimes people are just focused on, you know, the skills, whether it's, you know, mindfulness or uh, other uh, communication skills. And uh, I think the playfulness and fun element is often missing. And so the mixture of human levity, lightheartedness, along with human warmth and heartfulness is something uh, unique, I think, and something that we're going to be deepening into. And couldn't we all use a little more of that right now, right? <laughs> we can all so. use uh, a lot of it all the time, right? Life is short. We only have now, and uh, we can, uh, learning to get better at doing it well 
and you know chilling out lightening up um is something that we can all use a ton of i think and uh, if you're listening to this podcast and you want to you know have your employees your team loosen up and have some fun then check out the link in the show notes uh, and you can visit get some classes website and learn more about their really exciting cool class offerings and uh, joseph it's been such a pleasure thank you so much for stopping by uh, and please let me know when you're having a karaoke cooking event or something. Maybe we can have that at TV media. <laughs> Sounds like a plan. Uh, thanks so much for having me, Seth. All right.